the point of today's lecture is to prove Gundy's decomposition. And remember the point of Gundy's decomposition was that it lets you prove, assuming the UMD property for some P, it lets you prove that finite Martingale sign transforms have a weak type one one bound. So they map L1 into weak L1. And by interpolation and a duality argument, that's enough to show you that UMDP implies UMDQ for all P and Q. So that UMD is independent of P. So the important thing is to prove Gundy's decomposition. And the version of Gundy's decomposition that I've stated in the notes, I'm pretty sure that's not full generality. I'm not doing it for general martingales. I'm just doing it for martingales given by functions because that's all we need. I'm pretty sure there's probably a continuous time version of this that I don't know because I don't know continuous time stuff. But anyway, this is a, a simple Gundy decomposition. And yeah, the lecture is dedicated to proving that. But before we can start, we need to say a little bit more about stopping times because the proof is a heavier stopping time argument than we're used to. And there's a couple of notions that I forgot to define when I defined stopping times because I forgot that I needed them. So we need that first. But first I'm going to recall the definition of a stopping time because at least one person doesn't remember it. Given a filtration called A on a probability space, I'm going to start writing my probability space just as omega. I'm not going to write the you know, A and P anymore. Given a filtration, a stopping time T with respect to the filtration is a random variable T mapping the probability space into the natural numbers and possibly into infinity. such that the set of points in the probability space where the stopping time is less than or equal to n is always a n measurable for all natural numbers n. So at time n, you know whether the stopping time has occurred at time n. Right, that doesn't make sense. At time n, you know whether the stopping time is less than or equal to n. Maybe it hasn't occurred yet. You know that it hasn't occurred. It, you know, it's an information theoretic thing. So that's our little recollection of what a stopping time is. I can end the poll now. Very good. So the new notions I need to make about stopping times and filtrations and so on. So given a stopping time, the sigma algebra A sub T, which is a sub sigma algebra of A, is defined as follows. So what this sigma algebra should be is the sets that you know at time t. Now t is a stopping time. So t is a variable time on the probability space. It's not a fixed time like n. It could act, it depends on omega generally. So what can we say about sets that we know at time t? You have that a in a belongs to a sub t if and only if a intersect the set where t is less than or equal to n is in a sub n for all n. Now I was discussing this before the lecture started and a few of you saw that discussion and a few of you didn't that I've never been able to really understand exactly why this definition is the correct one, why this definition truly represents information you know at time t. And Tim gave me a definition from a book which is quite good. Um, not a definition but an explanation and I have to say, if I repeat that explanation, I'm going to mess it up. And furthermore, it's, I think, only really a concept that you can really get into your head after you've had people tell you a bunch of times and you've thought about it a while. And that's so, like, honestly, I understood it for the first time 10 minutes ago. So I'm not going to try to teach that understanding. But formally, we will see that this is kind of the right definition. Like, we'll see it in proofs and we'll see, yeah, this makes sense. This makes everything work. So you, you can feel free to understand this purely on a formal level. Just take this definition of a sigma algebra. I haven't proven that it's a sigma algebra, but it is. And that proof's not too difficult. I haven't called it an exercise, but feel free to do it. So given a stopping time with respect to filtration, you can define a sigma algebra coming from that stopping time. 
And the other thing I need to define is given an X valued stochastic process, F dot uh, adapted to the filtration A, of course. Does it have to be? Yeah, it does. So given this process and given the stopping time, T from above, we define a random variable F sub T. So we have F sub N for all N. Here is F sub T. This maps, I'm only gonna define it on the part of the probability space where the stopping time is finite, oops. So I'm gonna exclude all the omega such that T is infinite for technical reasons. And it's kind of a, an obvious definition, F of T at omega is F of T of omega at omega. So you can see why I didn't define it on the set where T equals infinity because we don't necessarily have a notion of F sub infinity in general. The martingale might not converge to anything. So there might not be a natural limit to take. So we only look at where the stopping time is finite and we can, we can stop the, the process at that point and we can evaluate it at that point. There's no problems in doing that. Okay, maybe everything's only defined almost everywhere and then you have to make the appropriate modifications, but that will all work, okay. So this is yeah, the value of F at the stopping time T. And a lot of stopping time arguments basically consist of taking stopping times and treating them like they're constants. And all of your intuition comes from that. Like T, although it's a stochastic, you know, non-deterministic time that depends on omega, you can treat it as a, a constant in a sense. It behaves roughly like that. They're just random times. That's all they are. So what do I need to say about this? This is the, the new notions we need. My screen isn't letting me scroll. I can write, but I can't scroll. Why is that? Now I can scroll, good. So let's make some notes about stopping times and filtrations and so on. So first just notice that for all N, the constant function N of omega equals N, that's a stopping time, right? With respect to any filtration whatsoever. This is like the simplest stopping time, a deterministic stopping time. You can check that the definition of a stopping time is vacuously satisfied because you have this condition that T is less than or equal to N, right? This becomes, oh, and this is for all N. So you have N less than or equal to M for every M and you, this sets either the whole space or it's empty. <laughs> yeah. So constant functions, the constant function N is a stopping time. Also given stopping times S and T, possibly constant, possibly not. This is with respect to a given filtration. Given two stopping times, the, the minimum of the two, just as a function on omega is a stopping time. So this will let you do things like define a stopping condition that gives you a stopping time. You can have two of them and you can say, when one of these conditions is satisfied, you stop. So when the smallest of the two stopping times arrives, you stop. And in particular, if you take the minimum of N and T, that's a stopping time. For all N. So you can define a stopping time by saying, let's take one stopping time and let's stop when we either reach that or N, whichever comes first. So you might be gambling and you might say, I'm gonna stop when I reach a million dollars or after 10 bets, whichever comes first, right? That's the stopping time. So we can define uh, a sequence of sigma algebras, A sub min NT as N varies. 
So, you know, we have these sigma algebras determined by stopping times. This minimum is a stopping time for each n, so it determines a sigma algebra. And we can look at all of those sigma algebras. We'll call this a sub min dot t, just to keep this convention of putting a dot where we put a variable n. <laughs> And we can also define random variables, f. So we have our process f lying around. And we can evaluate that at the stopping time. And in particular, we can evaluate that at the stopping time minimum n and t. We call that f sub min bullet t using the same notation. And what can I say about these? This is a filtration. It's not immediately clear, but it's an exercise. This is a good exercise because it forces you to understand that definition of the, the sigma algebra given by a stopping time, exercise 6.3 in the notes. And this process, this is called the process stopped at T. So what this process is, is you take the process F that you started with and you take a stopping time and when you reach that stopping time, you, you stop the process. You don't go any further. So you look at the values of F at either N or T, whichever is the smallest. So when T hasn't been reached yet, N is smaller than T. So you're just looking at F of N as N progresses. But once T is reached, you just have F of T. And that doesn't change anymore as N varies. But that T, of course, depends on omega. And there might be some points of the probability space where T is infinite and t you've never reached, and you just continue the process out to infinity, and you never stop it. And we use all of these concepts in the proof of Gandhi's decomposition. We don't need a really deep understanding of them, but we do need to, to know what they are. Um, I need to give one proposition before we actually go to, to Gandhi. What's this proposition? We take a Banach space, we take a probability space, and a filtration. Let's consider a function f, which is integrable and x valued. And let's take f dot to be the associated martingale. So f sub n is the expectation with respect to the sigma algebra a n of f. Uh, what do I want to say now? If t is a stopping time, which is allowed to be infinite, somebody needs to mute themselves. I hear a buzzing in my, yep, good. So if t is a stopping time, then the conditional expectation of F with respect to the sigma algebra associated with T that we just introduced is almost everywhere equal to the stopped process F sub T with the interpretation that F sub infinity in this case is defined by F. Because in this case, we do have a natural sense of F sub infinity. So T can be infinity at some points. And then what is F sub T of, of omega at that point? It's just F of omega by definition. Why is this useful? At least the reason this is useful for us. So it lets us prove this. When we take this stopped process and we take its integral, we take its L1 norm, we know that this is actually the L1 norm of a conditional expectation. And we know that conditional expectations are not expanding in L1. This is the real consequence that we need of this fact here. If we take a function and we stop it at a stopping time, we don't increase its L1 norm. That's the real thing we need. So that follows from the proposition once you prove it. And one other thing we need, 
do we need this? Maybe we don't need this. I'm still going to say it. The, pro the stopped process, stopping at time t. So you take the minimum of n and t for each n. The stop process is a martingale with respect to the filtration, well, the stopped filtration, if you want to call it that. That's probably what it's called. Let's prove it. Let's quickly skim the proof. What's going on in this proof? Yep. Yeah, okay. Let's just call this equality here star so that we can refer to it. First, I'll just note that if you have star, it implies that the stopped process can be written as conditional expectations with respect to these associated filtrations. like that. That's what this tells you. And that immediately tells you that the stop process is a martingale with respect to that filtration. So we don't need to do any additional proof for that. We just need to prove this conditional expectation property up here. Right, so that's all we need to show. Now, how we show this, we're showing that a conditional expectation is equal to something. So we integrate the function against all sets in that sigma algebra, and we show that the right um, equality holds for these integrals. We fix a set A in the sigma algebra A sub T. And we will show that the integral of F on A is equal to the integral of F sub T. On a. That will tell you exactly that the conditional expectation, conditional expectation with respect to the sigma algebra is F sub t almost everywhere by the defining property of conditional expectations and the uniqueness and so on. So we just have to compute this. Uh, we let A sub k be the set A intersect t equals k. We're going to sum over all possible values of the stopping time. It's an argument we've done before. We're going to do this for all k in the natural numbers and also including infinity because the stopping time can be equal to infinity in some places. And by the definition of the sigma algebra a sub t, this is in the sigma algebra a sub k. And this is for all k. Yeah, for all k. Um, yeah, I didn't say what the sigma algebra a sub infinity is. Let's say that that is a. Why not? It's the only thing we can define in this case. It's not a limiting sigma algebra in this case. We're defining it to be the full sigma algebra. That might not be the limit, but let's do that. So these sets A sub K. It's A intersect all the possible values of the stopping time. So this petitions A. Because the stopping time has to have some value on A. And it can only have one value at a time. Yeah, functions a single value. So we have a petition of A, and this lets us integrate, or lets us write the integral of f over A as the sum for all k and n, possibly infinite, of the integral over A sub k. That's the first step. And now we just rewrite this a bunch of times until we get what we want. So what can we do first? Since a sub k is in the sigma algebra a sub k, the integral of f over a sub k is actually the integral of fk over a sub k, because fk is the conditional expectation with respect to that sigma algebra. This is the martingale associated with f. That's what they do. Next, we say that, OK, well, we've still got each fixed k here. We're on the set ak. ak is where t equals k. Yeah, or where k equals t, to put it reversely. So f sub k is actually equal to f sub t on that set, including when k equals infinity. When k equals infinity, we're looking at the set a sub infinity. That's where t is infinite. And then f sub infinity here is just f, and f sub t is f by convention. So this equality also works for k equals infinity, just by the way we defined everything. 
that's why we defined it in that way, just to make this work. And now f sub t here, that's independent of k. So we can put the integral back together. We have the integral on a of f sub t dp. And that's what we wanted to show. Really nice, clean stopping time argument here. Just decompose the stopping time into all of its values, do things on the constant values, put it all back together. It's nice that we're working in discrete time because I don't think you can do that argument in continuous time. <laughs> it's a very discrete time thing. That's a nice simple proof of this fact up here that we ultimately need this, this L1 estimate for stop processes. I don't think there's an easier way of proving that. Well, maybe there is, I don't know. I should emphasize, I was thinking about this as I was proving it and I was thinking when you do this sort of thing in harmonic analysis arguments where you're looking at dyadic intervals and you pick maximal dyadic intervals and you petition and, and you know about them. And then you don't need these probabilistic arguments because the sigma algebras you're dealing with are all nice atomic dyadic things and you can actually do your arguments directly. And we're working in discrete time. So the stochastic stuff sort of easier, but we don't really assume any kind of regularity assumptions on our, um, on our sigma algebras, on our filtrations. So keep in mind, although it's discrete time and it's kind of easy, all of these sigma algebras could be quite bad, actually. You might not have atoms or anything like that. So there's still some subtle content hidden in here that you don't purely just get by the dyadic type arguments. Yeah. I think in the end, the hard thing is really just proving the existence of the conditional expectation. Once you've got that, so many things just follow. Anyway, now we can do Gundy's decomposition. And the rest of the lecture will be devoted to that. I'm going to restate Gundy's decomposition because I, I don't believe you could all have remembered that. I barely remember it. X is a Banach space. Omega is a probability space. F is in L1 valued in X and it's normalized. So it's L1 norm is one. A is a filtration. This is our setup. We're given a scale lambda greater than zero. And we're told that we can write F as a sum A plus B plus C, such that these terms satisfy the following properties. A, B, and C are all in L1. A's L1 norm is small, it's controlled by a one. Okay, it's less than or equal to a constant that doesn't depend on anything important. The probability of this set here, which is confusingly written. I don't know why I've written it this way. The set where one of the Martingale differences of A is non-zero is relatively small smaller than lambda to the minus one times a constant. So, Cause this is a little bit confusing. I'm gonna write this in a different way. This is the union over N of the sets where the end difference is not the zero vector. So it's the set where at least one of these differences is non-zero. And maybe I'll say omega such that the difference at omega just to really point out what I mean here. I've written it in this first way because this is how Pizier wrote it. And I sort of thought, yeah, Pizier probably knows what he's talking about, but I don't know why it's written this way. So that's what we get for A. B has this property that the, the different sequence is, is summable in X in quite a strong way. If you put the, not, the X norm on the inside of the sum, it's still in L1, which is quite a strong L1 assumption. And C is bounded. It's L infinity norms less than lambda times a constant. And it's L1 norm is less than one times a constant. 
And in particular, using the log convexity of LP norms, this tells you that C is in LP for every P. And its LP norm has a certain dependence on lambda and P. So the L infinity norm is less than lambda, the L1 norm is less than one, the LP norm is somewhere between the two, depending on the size of lambda. Typically, you might take lambda to be quite large, right? Or small, I, I can't remember what we're doing actually. I think, no, it, this is for all lambda. You don't want to think lambda large or lambda small. This is a statement that's for all lambda and it's equally powerful for all lambda, whether large or small. Okay. Right, that's Gandhi's decomposition. Let's prove it. Were there any questions before that? I haven't stopped and asked for questions, but you all know you can interrupt anyway, so it's no big deal. Right, let me quickly look ahead. Do we have an appropriate break point? We do. Let's see how it goes. We start by defining a stopping time. Uh, and this is called R. And R is the first time or the first N for which Fn is greater than lambda in norm. Um, yeah, I should say, of course, Fn is a conditional expectation with respect to An of F. Same for An and Bn. These are the associated martingales, well, the martingales associated to the filtration that we're working with. So that's the first step. We define that stopping time. Um, we also define for all n, we define v sub n, and this is a scalar, v sub n, scalar valued function, in fact, scalar random variable. It's the norm of the nth difference of f times the characteristic function of the set where r equals n. This maps omega to r. So what's VN doing? I mean, we'll see VN appear more times in the proof and it'll kind of make more sense as to why we chose it later on. But VN is like, you're looking at what the, the nth difference is doing when the stopping time is reached, at the time that the stopping time is reached. So N is the first time where FN is greater than lambda in norm. And this DFN is looking at FN minus FN minus one. So FN is the first one that's greater than lambda. So FN minus one is less than or equal to lambda. So we're kind of looking at a jump at the stopping time. We'll see more of that later on. We define two more stopping times. <laughs> Don't be too scared. We have three stopping times, but we only really have two that matter. Stopping time S is the first N for which the sum from K from zero to N of the AK conditional expectation of VK plus one is greater than lambda. These things are all stopping times because they're first hitting times of sets and we already proved that they were stopping times. Yeah. With, with respect to measurable functions. So in one case, it was a norm of FN. In this case, it's this sum of conditional expectations. All of these things are measurable. So these, these are stopping times. We don't need to prove that. The final stopping time is capital T of omega and that's just the minimum of S and R, or R and S, if you want to be in alphabetical order. Yeah. So we only really have two stopping times that matter. We have R and S, and then we have the minimum of the two. So we can say stop when one of these two conditions is satisfied. Okay, now having defined all of that, we can define the first term in our decomposition, which is A, a is f minus the stopped random variable f sub t. So we need to prove that, what do we need to prove about A? We need to prove it's in L1 with norm controlled by one. And we need to show that the probability that one of the differences is non-zero is controlled by reciprocal of lambda. This first property is pretty simple. When we take the L1 norm of A, we just use a triangle inequality. 
It's controlled by the L1 norm of F, which is one by assumption, plus the L1 norm of the stopped variable, F sub T. And we know from this proposition that we proved before that that's controlled by the L1 norm of F, yeah? So we can say this is less sim, you know, less than or equal to a constant times the L1 norm of F. That constant is two in this case, but we don't need to know what that two is. And this is equal to one by assumption. So A's L1 norms controlled, that was the first thing we needed. And yeah, we did rely on knowing that the L1 norm of, a, of F sub T for a stopping time is controlled by the L1 norm of F. We did all that work just for this L1 estimate <laughs> that we use in this one spot here. So we still need to show, need to show NTS that the probability that for some N, I'm writing it as norm, I don't need to write the norm. Probability that one of the differences is non-zero is controlled by lambda minus one. And we control this probability by writing the, the set in terms of other sets, classic argument. Suppose you've got an omega and suppose that DAN of omega is non-zero for some n. So suppose we're in this set that we're taking the probability of. So since our function A is F minus F sub T, we would have the DA, have I proven this thing properly? Let me just write what it is and then I'll check whether I've actually proven it. This implies that DFN of omega is not equal to DF min NT of omega for some N. I don't think I'll fully justify what I've said here, to be honest. Let's prove this properly. What's DA sub N? This is DFN minus DFTN. This is not zero. So this DFN we believe, but this, how do we know that the nth difference of the martingale associated with F sub T is this stopped dif this difference of the stop process. I don't think I've technically proven this, so we should prove this. Let me do a bit of a side note here. Side note. If we take the expectation with respect to A sub N of F sub T, do we get F sub min NT? Is the, the martingale determined by F sub T with respect to the original filtration A sub N, is this the same as a conditional expectation with respect to the stopped sigma algebra of F? It is true, but I don't think this is fully justified by what I've said so far. So we have to prove that. Luckily, I know how to prove it. Let's just get this right. Um, do I want to say it that way? No, let's do this instead. I'm sorry, I've confused myself for a moment. Um, feel free to chime in if you can find an easy solution to this mess or if I'm worrying about nothing. Uh, this is this conditional expectation of FT minus this conditional expectation of FT. How about I just move on with the proof and I'll figure out what's going on later on. Believe this for the moment, it is true. 
Yeah. Sorry for the confusion there. Are you using a martingale? Yeah, what I want to use actually is that. Um... I think you need that somewhere. I just can't see it. <laughs> what I need is this statement. that the stop process is a martingale with respect to the original filtration. I've said that it's a martingale with respect to the stopped filtration, but not the original filtration. And that's what we actually need to use here. And this, I've done this exercise before. Can we use telescoping property? Yeah, you probably can. Let's try that. Uh, wait. How do I want to use the telescoping property here? Wasn't that what the uh, so, so, Professor, the, the first thing you, you've written, yeah, um, F sub capital T conditioning on filtration A N, yeah. want to prove it, it is F conditioning on the, the, the minimum filtration. Oh, yeah, I, I could just um, write the integrals, couldn't I? Sorry, I could if I wanted to show that this were true. Uh, I mean. And yes. So the, on the left hand side, yeah. uh, you write F sub capital T as a, a conditional expectation. Ah, yeah. So I that. think that comes from. It will come oh, sorry, from that I'm once wrong. we prove sorry, it. Forget, for, forget about it. Sorry. I'm totally wrong. You're totally wrong. I don't know if you're totally wrong, actually. Um, It's a bit subtle, isn't it? This is not immediately obvious. Sorry, I got it wrong. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Sorry. I mean, I also got it wrong. So I think you're onto something. I don't think you're completely wrong. Um, what do I want to show here? I want to show that the integrals are the... Hmm. Say, so take... Suppose A is in this sigma algebra. And let's integrate f over a. So we're basically evaluating what this conditional expectation is. We want to show that it's equal to that one. <laughs> so what does this mean? A is in this sigma algebra. So a intersect, oh, this is going to be a mess. Yeah, I don't want to work with this minimum condition in the middle of a lecture because I'm going to get it wrong. Let's assume this for the moment and fix it later. <laughs> it does boil down to this statement here, which is true and which I have gotten blank on how to prove. We will assume this and prove it later, probably after the break, because I'm probably going to figure out how to do it during the break when I don't have the pressure of being in front of the camera. If we do assume this fact, then we do have that the, the nth difference of A is the nth difference of F minus the difference of the stop process, the nth difference of the stop process, which should be this. And then we can say that because the nth difference of A is not zero, then the, the nth difference of F is not equal to the nth difference of min NT F like that. Yeah. So we will have this. And this implies that T is greater than N. Well, the T of omega is greater than N. Wait, no, T of omega is less than N, sorry. Because if T of omega were greater than or equal to N, then you would have that min NT was N, then you'd have DFN equals to DFN. And that's the contradiction. And in particular, what this is telling us is that T of omega is finite. That's the conclusion we ultimately needed to get. Assuming that we're in this set, we're in the set where T is finite. So the upshot of all of that confusion, which I hope it makes more sense in the notes or after the break, the probability of the set is less than the probability that T is finite. That's what we needed <laughs> in the end. And because T is the minimum of S and R, 
this is less than or equal to the probability that S is finite plus the probability that R is finite. And now we can work with the definitions of the stopping times R and S. Estimate these separately. Let's look at the probability that R is finite. Uh, remember what R was. R was the first time where Fn is greater than lambda in norm. So this time is finite if Fn of omega, omega such that Fn of omega in norm is greater than lambda for some n. And that first n is the value of R, which is finite. We can rewrite this as the probability that of omega such that the, the dube maximal function of f dot at omega is greater than lambda because this maximal function is just the supremum over all of these fn omegas in norm. And we have the dube inequality, which says that this is less than or equal to lambda to the minus one times the L1 norm of f. This was the dube maximal inequality from a couple of weeks back. This is the L1 to weak L1 boundedness of the dube maximal operator. And yeah, this here is one. So that's lambda to the minus one, which is what we needed to show for R because we're showing that this probability here is controlled by lambda to the minus one. We're gonna show that kind of control for both of these terms individually. Yeah, we have it for one of them, we need it for the other. What's the probability that S is finite? So S was the first time that the sum from the first N such that the sum from K from zero to N of this, I'm not gonna write the N of this quantity here. S is the first N such that the nth partial sum of this thing is greater than Lambda. And these are all positive. So S being, in, S being finite says that the, the full limit of these partial sums is greater than lambda. Does that make sense? All of the sum ends are positive. So this thing is increasing. So if one of them is greater than lambda, then the whole partial sum is greater than lambda. And in fact, the converse is also true because we're looking at an open set here. You can't reach the open set from the outside of the set in the limit, right? Because the complement of an open set slows. Yeah. Right. So what we do is we use Chebyshev's inequality. If we're looking at a super level set, the, the measure of a super level set. So we can control that by lambda to the minus one times the L1 norm of the thing in the inside. But because everything in here is non-negative, we can just write that as a, we're gonna write it as an expectation. We don't need to put any norms on the inside. It's all already non-negative. like that. And the reason we write it with this expectation is because we're going to put this expectation inside the sum. Going to use linearity. We're going to have expectation of conditional expectation of VK plus one. And we're all familiar with expectations and conditional expectations now. And what we know is that the expectation of a conditional expectation is just the expectation. So that can go away. And we just have this. And while we're here, let's just re-index. We're going from K from zero to infinity. We have VK plus one. So let's call that K from one to infinity, the expectation of VK. How do we estimate that? Um, it should be time for a break, but I have a whole other page of proof to go for this. Let's. Let's do this term and then have the break. Everyone okay with that? No one needs to go quickly, good. I see Calvin's comment in the chat. I'm gonna look at that during the break. So we're estimating this, we're up to here. We want lambda to the minus one times one. So we have to estimate this thing here. If we look at the expectation of VK, 
taking the definition of what VK is, this is the norm of DFK times the conditional expectation, no, the, sorry, the characteristic function of the set where the stopping time R equals K. We have this nice little relation between the stopping time S and R. <laughs> so when we're looking on this set where R equals K, so when R of omega equals K, we know that FK of omega, as I said, when I was introducing the stopping time, it's greater than lambda because K is the first time where f of k is greater than lambda in norm. And because it's the first time, f of k minus one omega is less than or equal to lambda. k is the first time where this happens. And k minus one is less than k, <laughs> trivially, yeah? And in particular, we have that uh, f k minus one is less than f k in norm. We don't actually need to know anything about the lambda. We just need to know that this is less than that. That's what we're going to use. Because this will let us control this difference. Dfk omega is less than or equal to using the triangle inequality fk omega plus fk minus one. The norms of both of those terms. This is control less than or equal to two times fk omega but we don't care about that constant too. So at least when we sort of condition on the stopping time, we're not conditioning, but when, we, when we're on the set where the stopping time is equal to K, the difference is actually controlled by the, the function itself. That doesn't usually happen. So where am I? Here we are. So we're looking at this expectation here. And so we know that when we restrict to this set here, we have this control. And of course, we're still on that set, so we don't get rid of the conditional expectation, that characteristic function. I keep calling characteristic functions conditional expectations for some reason. Now, what can we do? Fk is the conditional expectation of f. And we have a pointwise estimate of norms of conditional expectations by conditional expectations of norms. We proved that way back in week one or two. So we can take the, the scalar conditional expectation of the scalar valued function given by the norm of f at omega. And now what we can do is we can notice that this set, the set where R equals K is a K measurable because R is a stopping time. This is the definition of a stopping time, which most of you remember, right? And so we have a conditional expectation with respect to the Sigma algebra AK times an AK measurable function. So we can actually put that function inside the conditional expectation. So it's the expectation of the conditional expectation. You see where this is going. Um, wait, I don't have any omegas lying around, do I? Why am I starting to put omegas here? I don't need them. Yep. We have that. And again, the, the expectation of a conditional expectation is just the expectation. And we're starting to lose all of this AK dependence in a nice way. So when we sum everything up, so remember the probability that S was finite was less than or equal to, did I have a constant there? I didn't, but the nice thing about estimates with implicit constants is you can always pretend you've got them even if you don't. Like that implicit constant here could be one. <laughs> you don't have to think about that. So it's controlled by lambda minus one sum from k from one to infinity of the expectation of vk. We've estimated that by the expectation of f on the set where r equals k. 
And now we can put the sum back inside the integral and we can sum up those sets where r equals k, sum over the possible values of the stopping time. This is the expectation of the norm of f on the set where the stopping time is between one and infinity. But we don't really need to use that information. This is simply less than the norm of f in L1. And that's one, yeah. So we get our lambda to the minus one that we needed. This controls A. So A is now controlled. And let's move on to the break from here.